Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Wonderful to see you all. We're thrilled to be here. Whoa, that, that is a big audience. Mm -hmm. That is a big <laughs> audience. Um, my name is Linda McDonald. I am the vice president of our learning and develop group for our global product managers at MasterCard, of which there are many. Um, and I am thrilled to be moderating the panel this morning, acting as your um, customer-centric spirit guide. <laughs> um, as, as I rely on these four esteemed leaders in product to take us through what do we actually mean when we talk about using data-driven tactics to build um, a customer-centric culture. So without further ado, I'd love all my fellow panelists to introduce themselves. And I might start on my left. Hi, my name is Joe Dryman. I lead design and research for Pendo. Um, Pendo is the only all-in-one application experience platform. So what that means is if you're looking to acquire new customers, you're looking to grow accounts, you're looking to retain them, you're trying to capture their feedback or share back what your plans are, Pendo has tools for all of those aspects. Um, and um, we recently have been uh, introducing new updates like Replay, which is a way where you can view um, how customers actually act in product. So you don't just see the feedback they're submitting, you can actually see what they were doing at the time. And we um, use our analytics to help you understand which replays to watch, because there might be hundreds or thousands in a given week, and you want to focus on just the one that makes a difference and creates that insight that, that you need to drive your roadmap. Some of the upcoming work for us, um, one product is called Discover, where we're changing the feedback model from getting in the deluge of customer inputs that you're not sure how to fit into the roadmap. And instead, you share your plans. Customers give you specific feedback on those items. And then you can use Validate to test quickly whether your solutions resonate with customers. Uh, also, AI-driven outcomes, where we use our analytics to identify um, where you can make the biggest difference in your business, for example, for retention or growth. And then we suggest for guides that uh, will lead you there. Yeah, so hi, my name is Jake Canan. I lead the uh, global sales engineering team for Quantumetric. So I'm kind of more on the commercial side, uh, Quantumetric being very much a kind of a B2B company. Um, <clears throat> I'll save you the, the pitch on Quantum, but you're welcome to meet us out at the booth here. Um, I guess from my perspective, kind of where I come from is I work with all the folks in the room, basically, or, or folks like you. Um, helping you make data-driven decisions for your companies. Um, but I also do that myself internally, so I, I kind of act as the uh, voice of the field um, of what we see in the market in terms of uh, what our prospects and our customers need and trying to leverage that data to help make our own uh, customer-centric decisions. Then I'm Sarah Logel. I'm an experienced research consultant at User Testing. User testing is a video-based platform that helps you connect with your customers and get insight to make better decisions. As an experienced research consultant, or what that is, I think it says UX researcher, a little bit different. Um, I work with a lot of our customers to help them up-level their research practice. And so I kind of get this backstage pass to see what our different organizations doing so can bring that perspective today. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Uli Farkas. I'm the Vice President of Product in Glassbox, uh, which means that I basically lead uh, the entire product department at UX. Um, and what Glassbox does is Glassbox is a platform for digital experience intelligence where we put a huge emphasis on data. So we collect 100% of sessions data, user interactions, technical events, feedback. And using that data, we generate insights for our customers you know, throughout the journey um, of analysis from the single interaction to user journeys to product insights and user level insights. Um, and I'm, I'm actually pretty excited to be here because I'm both a leader and this topic is about culture. So I have the opportunity to influence from the top to bottom, but also I have the opportunity to influence from the bottom up because I'm a data geek. So a lot of times in my company, I actually do hands-on data analysis and kind of try to install culture using that um, mindset. And with regards to data, we put a lot of emphasis in Glassbox on data. So one of the things that we just uncovered is our new solution that's called Voice of the Silent, where basically imagine that most of your customers, um, well, when you run VOC campaigns, you got pretty limited amount of feedback. We utilize our data to actually extrapolate and infer what would be the feedback of a person that did not provide it. So you actually get a true sentiment uh, gauge of your market and your users and understand and act with confidence on that data. Great, thank you everyone. So if we start from the top, data-driven tactics to build a culture, a uh, customer-centric culture, what does that mean? Joe, maybe, maybe you take a stab at breaking that down. 
Yeah, I'll start with saying that data-driven isn't the phrase I would use. I would use data-informed because you don't want to cut out the judgment of people as they're um, understanding what, uh, what they're finding. Um, so first of all, just being customer-centric, I'll focus on because that means you're building a culture that cuts through any infighting to focus on your source of growth as a business, which is your customers. This is the people who um, onboard and help you grow or grow existing accounts. Um, I think to start with, you want to create a shared understanding across your business of what customers are actually doing. And that goes from analytics through customer journeys through that feedback. Um, my suggestion is you um, find a way of building um, a dashboard, for example, that you can start every planning conversation with, uh, from executive planning, quarterly planning, all the way down to sprint planning, and have everyone who's involved in it um, see that as their baseline, so that you uh, share um, you know, the evidence from which you start to keep yourself honest. As you then do the planning, you move forward and you, um, you introduce changes. I think it's also really important in that to combine both the um, kind of evidence of scale that you get from an analytics solution and something like the empathy that you get from watching customers in product or um, the conversation, the feedback you get from them. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and to sort of build on that a little bit further, if Sarah, maybe I could ask you, you know, why is that so critical yeah. in today's environment? I think to add on slightly to, to Joe's point, I think, yeah, whenever I think about customer centricity, what is that? How do we see that manifest in organizations? I think it comes from leaders and building that culture from the ground up. So excited to hear kind of what you have to say there. But I think, yeah, shared understanding. Um, we collaborate with that shared understanding. We have discussions and push and engage with each other. Um, we have this belief that we don't make decisions that are just assumptions, our opinions, and even if it comes from an executive, has to be discussed and backed with data. Um, and also, I think you mentioned it, like, we have analytics and, and we have data, but what's the human behind it as well? I think that's a key thing, hearing from Booking earlier of what are the unmet needs? What's that human experience outside of the product? And so why? Why are we talking about this? Why does this matter? Um, I think there's a stat from, I want to get it right, from Gardner, 84% of products and experiences don't meet customer expectations. So in a hyper-competitive world, there's this need, right? We are, we're competing with each other, we're competing with time, we're competing with other products. And so we need to be on top of it from a customer experience to maintain loyalty, to acquire new customers, and from an efficiency perspective. Um, I think we, we see that and kind of what we mean whenever we talk about customer centricity is how are we using data and insights to make decisions all across the, the development process. So hypotheses are driven by data. We're really understanding the problem. We're incorporating that along the way because another reason why it's so important is I think there's like $2.4 billion in software spend that's kind of waste essentially. And so if we can embed insights across that, we can cut down on that waste. Um, one example I'll just share is I work with a very large uh, customer, very big business, and this team's focused on content and the help center. So their whole goal is to reduce calls to the call center. They have a lot of analytics. They actually have a lot of data in analytics, but one thing that was missing is they weren't understanding the why and the person behind the analytics and how to make um, improvements and decisions based on that. So what they did was they understood the problem a bit more in that early on phase, used those learnings to um, do how might we, you know, how might we improve this solution? And then they, they launched it and were able to see 15 percentage point improvement in their experiments over time when they adopted this data-centric mindset. Um, so yeah, long, long way of saying, sorry, I'm rambling, uh, customer loyalty retention, and then I think efficiency from a business perspective is why this is so key. So, I mean, the rationale is there and is compelling. I mean, those stats alone, I think, speak to that. But I think all of us appreciate that this is not an easy thing to do and that there are barriers and challenges, you know, I think, to be overcome. So I'd love to hear from, from some of you some of your experiences. And, you know, maybe, Muli, if I could put this to you, what are some of the barriers that you've come up against when trying to work in this way? Absolutely. So um, I think one of the things that we have to realize is that, you know, the culture doesn't stand for, for its own, right? Mm -hmm. The purpose is to create delightful customer experiences. 
But in reality, especially in big companies, uh, we have a lot of different stakeholders, different disciplines, different groups, and they have different metrics, goals, processes. They're measured differently, and they work operating in silos. Like consider digital experience, you've got product managers, they care about adoption or maybe revenue. You've got IT people, they care about application performance or marketing people care about conversion. Some operate in sprints, some operate in, you know, according to a specific uh, campaign cycle. So that by essence can create fragmented experiences for our clients. So what's really, really important is to solve the internal alignment first. And I see kind of three different levels to treat it. One is about organizational structure or teams. The second is about your process, and the third is about your tools. So if we start with teams, it's about building cross-functional teams like agile squads that actually have multidisciplinary um, professions in them, and leading those teams with a product person and a technical lead. But it's not only about having those two people, it's about measuring them with a metric that's customer-centric and actually even incentivizing them uh, to act on that. So that creates internal alignment for them. A lot of our clients, by the way, use um, Glassbox Struggle Score, which is a measurement of identifying how easy it is for a user to complete an action. And that's actually their metric to align those teams, and they operate according to that metric. And then when you go to process, I think the key is to create recurrent processes that have two per serve two purposes. One is to bring those people together on a recurrent basis and create a collaboration, and the second is to weave into the product um, life cycle, those inputs from the field and actually influence what you're developing, you know, with the customer-centric mindset. Um, and it, it needs to be simple enough but powerful. So um, some clients, for example, of us use our session replay capabilities and they hold what's called movie nights where they watch sessions together, they dissect them and kind of come up with insights that they then bake in back into the product. And that creates that stickiness factor. That's the process that uh, basically boost up their ability to operate as a highly functioning team. And then lastly, when we talk about tools, so obviously you got to have the data platform that enables you to connect everyone together, right? Mm -hmm. So each uh, persona, each uh, discipline have their own metrics and their own angle, but you, they also got to be able to work together and look at things holistically and kind of tie the different pieces together. Um, and in essence, I think that we should strive to not measure the traditional metrics. For example, uh, marketing campaigns, it's not about conversion to a specific landing page. What if we think about, could we measure a marketing campaign Does it by the fact that it leads a user to their aha moment, then that makes them convert you know, to a paid customer. Um, application performance, it's not about, did I improve the loading time by X amount of seconds? It's about, does it correlate with customer satisfaction? You know, and similarly, obviously, product people, to incorporate feedback from the field continuously into their product roadmap and into their development, which we know that we all want to do, but sometimes it's really hard. And Jake, maybe if I could look to you to, to share some of your experience in that. I, I feel like barriers are one that there are many of. Yeah, so um, from my personal observations, both uh, externally and internally, so with, with my customers as well as even um, the decisions that we make internally, I think the, the two biggest challenges that I personally witness are kind of the, the hippo problem and then just the fact that I think data is so much harder than uh, we give it credit uh, for. I think we kind of expect everyone to be these amazing data experts and it's just really, really challenging. Um, on the hippo side, if you're not familiar with the term, you probably most, most are, but um, it is the deadliest, one of the deadliest animals in the, in the world, but it's also one of the deadliest ways to uh, end a productive meeting. Um, it's just the highest paid person's opinion, right? And we kind of struggle with that constantly. Um, on the hippo side, you know, I personally find that a lot of times that they're backed with probably a mountain of, of evidence and data that could uh, possibly prove that their opinion is actually quite good. It's just not been formulated and it's not been distributed. And I think um, one of the things that we can do with hippos is um, we can kind of try to lean into their opinions the same way that we lean into our own with a bit of optimism and try to remove as much bias as we have and see if we can use data to, to help inform those opinions. Um, don't try to immediately go to see how we can tear them down and destroy them, but actually how we can build them. And I think when you do that, um, you can, uh, you know, Sarah, you said 84% of products don't meet customer expectations. 
you know, when somebody has a really great opinion, it could be a really great opinion, but um, if you don't bring the data into it and kind of shine the lights on things that um, are kind of hidden, you will end up putting out a pretty mediocre product. So you can take these opinions and you can evolve them and you can shape them and um, uh, make them something pretty beautiful. Um, and when you do that, when you bring that value to those opinions, I think you kind of put a little political capital in the bank so that you can come back and do that with your own opinions and your own team. So um, I would say there's a lesson somewhere in there about hippo taming, um, which is probably something I'm going to put on my LinkedIn after this. Um, on the data being hard, um, I pride myself in being kind of a, more of an engineer. So uh, in my title, there's sales and engineering. And depending on who I'm talking to, I'll lean into one of those. But, um, but on the engineering side, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at tech. I can build most things. I can kind of figure out any technology. But I think data is incredibly hard. I've been in some sort of analysis or data for 10 years. And um, Muli, you and I were talking earlier that it's, um, it constantly lies to you, or we find ways to lie to ourselves with data. Um, and if you think that data is not hard, unfortunately, you are probably underthinking it. Um, and um, I think some of the tactics that I've seen work really well is that instead of kind of forcing everybody to be in this kind of data-driven mindset, we should at least have an appreciation for it, but um, we have to find the people that are extremely passionate, extremely capable, um, and uh, will stop at nothing and interrogate every hypothesis uh, and, and show the value in being data-driven. And so, um, so um, I think hippo taming, helping evolve those hippo opinions, and then from a data-driven perspective, which is maybe it's on those agile teams or uh, those cross-functional teams, is kind of finding the digital heroes, as we call it, to uh, be the beacon of uh, data-driven tactics, I think is Great. something that works well. Fantastic. So I think, you know, we've, we've set the stage, you know, pretty well for defining, okay, so what do we mean when we say to, you know, build a customer-centric culture? Why is that important and what are some of the challenges? For, for those in the room maybe that are only starting out on this, is there any advice, maybe Joe, I'll, I'll look to you for this, any advice you can share on how, how do you begin? Where do you start? Yeah. First of all, Sarah made a good point for the scale of the problem that we're trying to deal with here. So uh, I hope you took this panel already as like the, um, the impetus to start and try it today. And Pretty much all of these products have free trials, so I'd say just to get started and try it out. The first stage for me is to start building a way of tracking uh, your customers in a way that you can share with your entire team. So mm -hmm. maybe you start with the dashboard, you put the analytics in, you put the customer feedback in, maybe add a few replays. So you're starting to build the evidence and the empathy, and you share that across your organization. And then I said this earlier, you start with every planning meeting. So think of whenever you set out a new plan, just ground yourself in the evidence and the latest insight. One of the particular tricks that I like is uh, you can ask anyone else who takes part in this to share the data. It doesn't always have to be you as a product manager. So whether it's design or engineering or research or another group, um, ask them to interpret it. Because what they're going to find is they need to familiarize themselves with the data. Um, they need to understand the, check their own understanding. Mm -hmm. And you might get to a place where you get a new kind of challenge that maybe you're not familiar with. Um, <coughs> You'll all have different relationships with how it works with uh, your engineering organization, for example, but sometimes they want to build a thing because it's really interesting and a big and a complex problem, but that doesn't always solve the customer's needs to what you've already heard today. Um, now, when you have the shared understanding, one of the early ways that you know that it's starting to work is that maybe when you go into a sprint refinement, someone might challenge you, an engineer might challenge you and say, hey, I saw this customer feedback. I see this drop off in this funnel over here. And you're talking about this other thing that is not addressing these problems. Now, I'm not suggesting you need to immediately pivot and change your plan and do that every time. But it's the kind of culture where there's a little bit of push and pull around the right goal. And that's what you want. Like You want an engineer to be engaged enough, understand the customer well enough, so they will actively challenge the plan. And then you can have a good conversation around, hey, we're not acting on that today because it's not the right segment. These are not the customers who are looking to grow at the moment. Overall, it's going well for them. Or, yeah, you're right, we do need to lean into that. We haven't you know, integrated into the plan yet. Do you have ideas? How do we actually now go about doing that? So I think if you, if you get to a point where you have a shared understanding and you create some of that challenge, focus on the customer, I think you'll be in a really good spot. Great, great point. And then for those organizations that are maybe a little bit further ahead, so maybe a bit more mature and are looking to elevate their approach, maybe Muli, if I could put this to you, what, what might you suggest or offer? So I think, um, you know, to elevate to you, two 
that uh, level basically means to make customer centricity a strategic asset of a company versus just a culture. And to make it strategic means that it actually needs to influence business results. Now, you know, we all do planning. What companies are measured for is business success, which you know, is manifested in revenue, in uh, metrics like net dollar retention, as an example. And it's not always that clear how the customer um, experience relates to those metrics, right? More than that, you actually you have a lot of noise, meaning you might have um, feedbacks, measurements that reflect a certain sentiment of customers, but you have a lot of those. Which one do you want to act on? So, uh, for example, in my, in my career, a lot of the planning techniques that I used uh, utilize what's called an OKR framework, an objective and key result, which is basically a framework that enables you to plan on a yearly or quarterly basis what do you want to do from the um, top level of the business uh, outcomes down to each and every team, right? But then actually drawing that data line is super important because I'll give an example. You know, we might say as a company, it's super important for us to improve net dollar retention this year, right? So, okay, so how do we make users, you know, be retained more? Well, first of all, not all user segments are equal, quite honestly. You got users that are more aligned to your uh, revenue mechanism and users that are not. Um, and secondly, not all user flows are um, aligned to what you want to achieve on a business level. So if we take that example of net dollar attention, we might do some analysis and find out that it's mostly influenced by a certain user segment and also uh, what is best correlated to net dollar retention, which is a business metric, is stickiness, right? And stickiness is measured by you know, the recurrence of, of people getting into your platform. So now you start zooming in on a specific user segment on their stickiness and you're saying, how am I going to increase the adoption of that user segment? And I will prioritize that higher than another segment. Now, the next thing is also at the company level, there are sometimes way too many goals. So to operate successfully, you actually need a highly collaborative cross-org process in that uh, planning cycle. And what that means is that you don't only go from top to bottom, but you also go bottom up, meaning you cascade goals from the company level um, to the individual departments and eventually people, but then you want the people to voice their opinions from the field and get those feedbacks and kind of elevate them to the company goals and see, do they intersect? And if they're not, sometimes you would actually disqualify some of the goals that you put for yourself as a company. And that makes every participant in the company, every employee, a key strategic asset and makes their voice uh, be heard. Um, and actually, you know, you already understood, I'm a data geek, so I'm, I'm thinking a lot about how to use data to generate technology that actually helps our clients elevate to that 2.0 level, right? So for example, you know, with machine learning and Gen AI, one of the opportunities that we're now building towards is, well, could we, for example, uh, create an AI assistant that actually talks to a business stakeholder that's in charge of a business result, a business metric, but assist them throughout the journey of pulling each and every employee that's relevant to solve an issue or to tackle an opportunity and also drive the process of execution and basically utilize technology to tackle those two pillars of, um, of strategic alignment and empowerment of people and collaboration. Fantastic. In, in closing, I, f I feel like we could, we could take over the stage and I, I promise we won't. I promise this will be our wrap-up. But in closing, if, if each of you could maybe share for the audience today, what's the one thing that you would urge them to take away with them from, from today's panel? Sarah, I might start with you. Yeah, I think, hmm, one thing. I think we're talking about customer centricity and we all probably in the room, like, no, it's good, right? We've talked about the why up here, but I think really focus on your why. Why do you wanna push for more data? Why do you wanna push for focusing on the customer and make that why very clear so it's an easy story to tell internally as well. I think one of the kind of key metrics in a change framework, because this is big change management we're talking about here, is um, align on your vision and build your coalition. So what's your vision of why you want to get to this point and have that nailed down so you can then communicate that with others? Muli? Yeah, um, so <clears throat> I think it, it's a very long journey to get to a highly operating system of customer centricity that creates business value, right? And you don't want to get um, kind of thrown off in different directions as you go at it. So I would recommend to focus on one thing that you feel isn't really working well right now. It could be one metric, one process, right? And start small and iterate. 
and almost like measure how you're going to measure, <laughs> meaning measure your effectiveness in driving uh, a data-driven, customer-centric culture. Does it work for you? And then learn from that and then scale up because if you're not doing that, you potentially, you know, you're, just, you're going to lose yourself in that journey. So I think um, to the extent that you're thinking like organizationally and like you said, big change management and coalition, um, agree with what Muli said, was really starting small, but from the perspective of uh, with your people. So, um, you know, don't just go buy a technology and drop everybody's email address in it and think that you're going to change your culture. It's not going to happen. Um, it doesn't happen until you meet it with the right people in process. And so I think if you can find those individuals that are kind of accelerators or, um, um, yeah, I don't know, that have a cascading effect to the organization, um, find those people, build them as kind of digital heroes and digital champions and, and so that they can kind of be your surrogates and or maybe you know, coalition, yeah. And Joe. They're all really important points, and I want to just underline that you cannot be successful unless you follow these paths. Um, so I'll add the last component that we haven't mentioned, which is the, the tools that you're going to yeah, use to do that. Um, you want to look for one that um, covers all the different kinds of insights you need, and in a way where you can get the insight when you need it, not after a few more weeks of changes and then establishing a baseline. that It takes too long, right? You need to make quick decisions. So. Absolutely. Well, look, thank you guys so much for those fantastic insights. I think, you know, the key message for me in this anyway is to really create a customer-centric culture, it's the sum of the parts. There is no one metric, no one tool, no one leader who can do this. All of these things need to be aligned and cohesive to really drive change. So I'd like to thank you all for your expertise and your insights. Um, and just to remind everyone in the audience, if you'd like to dive deeper with any of the panelists, they'll all be available in the expo hall later on today for a conversation. So thank you, and thank you. Thank you.